Hey guys, how you doing? Yeah, I am Sheikh Afan Sasper. Yeah, Elkin, I'm gonna destroy that objection. That's one of the arguments I'm going to decimate. Colossians 2:14, Matt Slick's distortion of it because I know he's gonna bring it up in our debate. But be more than happy, Elkin, to call me to show you why. If you interpret it the way Matt Slick does, you're gonna end up destroying your own position and embarrassing yourself. Colossians 2:14. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, uh, Ilkin. So my brother, do me a favor, guys. Let's let's begin before I even begin in prayer. Matthew Geisler, let me know when you want to get blocked. Do you want to get blocked now? Or do you want to get blocked later? Because already we're starting, People, the people are starting to manifest and talk about irrelevant issues and start debates. Okay, so let me know when you guys want to get blocked because I'm not going to tolerate it. No matter how many times I tell you guys, when you come to this channel, do not bring up irrelevant issues that you may think are relevant to the topic and start debates and division and wars on unnecessary issues. I don't know how many times I, I need to say this. It's, it's, it's mind boggling to me. Why do I have to repeat myself over and over again? So like Piker Biker's got to go because now he's trying to get all Greek on me on baptizo and baptisma because he thinks he's going to impress me with his knowledge of the Greek. You see? <sighs> no, uh, Ilkin, don't worry about it. I, I, I don't mind addressing your statement about Colossians 2.14 if you really want to hear. Let me begin in prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to show up. We're going to talk about some rules again to make the most out of these sessions so I don't cause you to stumble and then you don't make me stumble in sin so that I end up then dishonoring the Lord Jesus or causing people to <clears throat> stumble in sin as well, right? All right, yeah, I'm a lot of spirit. Okay, so let's come together, let's pray together. Let's be of one heart, one accord, one mind. Let's seek the glory and beauty and majesty of Jesus Christ. Let's seek to honor the Lord Jesus, love the Lord Jesus. Let's seek to yield more to the Holy Spirit, beg and beseech the Holy Spirit to fill us and possess us and take over our entire beings and transform us for the glory of Jesus Christ, okay? Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. No, Kenneth, it takes a while. That's YouTube. YouTube eventually will <clears throat> allow the chats to appear. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Please, my God, watch my God, my Son, King, Lord Jesus Christ. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Shalom. Yahovah, Shalom. Yahovah, Shalom. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let's come in agreement. Ask the Lord Jesus to sanctify, sanctify us, to perfect the bond of unity <clears throat> that we have in union with the Holy Spirit, the bond of peace that unites us, <clears throat> As we are cleansed and washed in the blood of our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and sealed by the Holy Spirit of the Father and the Son in Jesus' name. Yahovah Shalom, Yahovah Shalom, Yahovah Shalom, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Yira, Yahovah Yira, Yahovah Yira, Yahovah Nisi, Yahovah Nisi, Yahovah Nisi, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Abba. Lord Jesus, Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We need you, Abba. We need you, Son of God. We need you, Holy Spirit. So, Father, I ask. In the matchless name of your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, by the authority he has given us to approach you with boldness and confidence, knowing for the sake of the beloved, your heart who became flesh, and by the blood that cleanses us to stand before you worthy, the blood of your Son, our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I ask, destroy distractions of Satan. Destroy <clears throat> the attempts of the evil one and his agents to cause us to fight, <clears throat> to attack, to cause each other to sin and stumble and to grieve your heart, Father. Save us from that by the almighty blood of Jesus Christ, cleansing us and purifying us and washing us and shielding us and fill us with the Holy Spirit of life, Father. Crucify our flesh. Destroy our sinful passions. Destroy our weaknesses. Destroy my unrighteous anger, my impatience, my lack of self-control. Give us perfect control over our emotions and sanctify them for the glory of Jesus. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, Father. And Father, please loosen my mouth and my tongue. Save me from stammering and stuttering. Save me from confusion. Save me from stumbling. Save me from error and destroy my <clears throat> pride and arrogance and ego, Father. In grace and mercy and love, my, my Father, in Jesus' name. 
and perfect my ability to recall the scriptures and interpret them correctly and perfectly for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. Purify my motives, not to do it for fame or fortune, Father, but for the glory of Jesus. And truly love your children. Love them with the love from the Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus. Fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this, and the holiness to delight your heart, Father. All of us, make us holy unto the Lord Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Strengthen my voice, strengthen it, to use it to glorify Jesus. And bless the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your children, Father. And illuminate them, Father, with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from the Holy Spirit, and empower us by your Spirit to then plunge the depth of Scripture, bring out the meat of Scripture, feast on the table of Scripture, and live it out passionately without shame without compromise for the glory of jesus so that jesus will increase in us father more of jesus less of us especially less of me father he'll sin and throne upon our hearts and the hearts of our loved ones my daughter's hearts are your throne the throne of your son the throne of your spirit sanctify our hearts the hearts of our loved ones and my daughters for the glory of jesus please father have your way and bless the internet connection and save us from error and stammering and confusion and fighting May you be glorified, Bobby. May you be glorified, Son of God, Lord Jesus. May you be glorified, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. I'm drinking coffee, so if you see holy saliva coming out of my mouth, bear with me. Let me just share real quickly some rules. Real quickly some rules. Help me to help you not to stumble like David Wood is notorious for coming here. He's a stalker. He stalks me. He comes and attacks, does a hit and run and leaves. No side talks. No side tangents. No debates. No attacking. No mocking. No blaspheming the Lord Jesus. And if you disagree with me, articulate your disagreement in a loving manner so I know you're a brother or sister of the Lord Jesus Christ that's not here to attack and fight with me. And you can call me on Skype. We can have a fruitful, loving discussion but if you come here and attack you know again i'm a work in progress if you love me for the sake of the lord jesus pray god will save me from my imperfections my impatience my anger and i don't like to be bullied something about being challenged triggers that imperfection in me where i feel like i'm being bullied and attacked and i need to defend may the lord jesus jesus the son of god loosening my tongue to always love and praise him save me from that so brethren help me Help me to grow to be more like Jesus. So please honor that in this chat session. You don't have to come here, but I'm blessed that you're here because that tells me you want to learn. Secondly, secondly, I've had to block two people on Facebook. One young brother in the Lord Jesus because he didn't like the fact that I now affirm water baptismal regeneration. So I had to block him. That's fine. He comes on my comment section. He's shocked by my position and he wonders why. I was angry and harsh with him and blocked him. Okay. I blocked another gentleman named Kevin Ward, who comes pretending to be my brother in Jesus Christ, telling me he disagrees with my position about Mary and doesn't want to talk to me on air and bring out his objections. He wants to do it privately, and I told him he can take a hike. I'm not interested in people trying to show me I'm wrong, not because of pride. Let me tell you why. May the Lord Jesus destroy my pride. I don't want to be like David Wood, who's here stalking me, but I still love him for the sake of the Lord. That's the white man for you. He's got to get attention. Okay. Let me tell you. Okay. I do not learn when someone comes and tells me I'm wrong. I used to say this to the Catholics and the Orthodox and the Assyrian Church. In fact, many Catholics remember that I used to be harsh with them. Many were actually hurt, and I apologized to them that I hurt them because they thought I hated the Catholic Church. This was in during the time where I was more open to the Catholic Church, but I still wasn't that open, right, where I was considering maybe going back to the church of my fathers or any of these churches that the Holy Spirit wants me to embrace. So guess what they would do? They would come and tell me I'm wrong and try to correct me, and I would get angry, and I wasn't very gracious. Now who's doing it? Protestant brothers and sisters. Now, my Protestant brothers and sisters, they're doing the very thing I used to ask Catholics and Orthodox not to do. Okay? Yeah. Well, what's this? Stop trying to wax eloquent. Call me on Skype. Correct me. Don't be brave in the comments section. See, this is why I despise cowards like you. I can't stand people like you. 
You are brave in the comment section, but you're not meant to call and show me where I'm wrong. These positions I arrived at after many years of agonizing over the evidence. You, on the other hand, are a puppet and a clown, a tool of the devil that you think you know scripture. And you think because you remain consistent, that means you're sound. But you're a tool of the devil. And I'll muzzle you, but you're not man enough to call me. You see? You're not a man. See, I'm calling you out. Call me on Skype and show me the area of my ways. Okay, now. But we, know, we both know you're not going to do it because you're not man enough. You can only bark as a tool of the devil. Glory to Jesus Christ. Now, now, what are my Protestant brothers and sisters are doing? They're doing the very thing I used to tell Catholics don't do. This is how I learn. Can I tell you how I learn? You guys want to get to me? You want me to consider your position? You know how? You don't come and tell me I'm wrong and attack me because I'm a sinner and I'm asking God to sanctify me. You tell me, hey, brother, what do you think about this passage? What do you think about this objection? What do you think about this article? What about this debate? That's how you'll get my attention. And then I'll listen or read. And then if I think it's a good argument, I'll simmer on it. And it'll stay in my mind. And I'll wrestle with it. You get my point? That's how you're going to get me to consider your position. But if you come and tell me I'm wrong and I can't believe it, and you want to attack me, you're going to lose me, man. You're Honestly, you're going to lose me. So do you really love me? If you think I'm an error and you love me for the sake of Jesus, then don't push me away. Work with me. Don't tell me I disagree and you're wrong and I want to have a private conversation with you. Don't do that because that to me is arrogance and pride that you are going to talk to me in private and set me straight. Don't do that. Don't do that, please. Please, guys, let's not do that. And by the way, let me repeat why I came to accept water baptism or generation. Not only is there plenty of scriptural proof of it, but this was the unanimous teaching of the early church before even the schism. Let me repeat. This was, this was the unanimous position of the early church before the schisms. That's why the Coptic church, the Orthodox church, the Catholic church, the Assyrian church of the East, and the early church fathers, and it's in the Nicene Creed, and even Martin Luther affirm water baptismal regeneration, and that God, through water baptism, granted you the gift of the Spirit and forgiveness of sin. So if, I'm, if you think I'm wrong, I'm in good company. I'm on the side of the church fathers. So if I'm wrong, they're wrong, so do you condemn them as false Christians like David Wood? David Wood, this white supremacist, thinks that he's God's gift to theology. So let's all follow David Wood and his theology, and then we're sound. And if you disagree with David Wood, he'll bash you, he'll ostracize you, he won't promote you as he's making the mega bucks. And by the way, for those of you, because I'm going to get comments again. Is it, you got beef with David Wood? No, dude. We banter back and forth. Please, guys, do not send me another 10,000 comments saying, hey, what's your beef with David Wood? I thought you guys are friends. No, no. He's my enemy. I keep him close. Why? You want to keep your enemies close to always know what they're doing and plotting, right? Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. So only work with him. Pretend I love him so I can know his dastardly, deceitful scheming to keep safe from him. Okay, now that's it. Can we get into the meat of the matter in Jesus' name? No, Eric, anyone can take snippets out of any father to make him say anything. The same Protestants will say that Tertullian denied that the Eucharist is the body blood of Christ because he talks about the bread and the wine being figures, not realizing that what Tertullian meant by figures, the figures that convey the reality, the figures that show the reality of the thing, not a figure, meaning it's simply symbolic in the sense that bread is simply a figure of the body. No, it's a figure conveying the reality which the bread is. And what is the bread? By prayer and the grace of the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ. Anyone can take snippets of the fathers and make them say anything. And I used to do that as well. I used to do that as well. I did that. I wanted the church fathers to affirm sola fide. I wanted the church fathers to be divided over the nature of the Eucharist. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying... There weren't fathers that disagreed. I'm not talking about one or two dissenting voice. Let's say you have 100 church fathers representing the Orthodox Church, meaning the true church, and fought for the true church and even died as martyrs. Out of the 100, two of them may disagree. 98 agrees. 
You see what I'm trying to talk about? And why am I saying that? Because someone said, well, the fathers are not infallible. They're not inspired. They're not errant. Neither are you. Neither am I. Neither is your church. Pay attention here. I need you guys to understand because this is going to segue into water baptism. Are you guys following with me? So for someone to use that argument, again, you're insulting me and showing me you don't get it. You don't understand why I came to this position. Okay. Let me tell you. I didn't say the church fathers are inspired and errant infallible, but neither are you, neither am I, neither are your churches, neither was Martin Luther. This is what I'm saying. Can you guys understand? Because I got a lot of meat. You're going to get blown away today. You're going to get blown away today with Noah's baptism. Glory to Jesus. Glory to God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for setting me free to let Scripture speak. Because you're going to get blown away because these are things I'm learning because we're stuck. Stu we're, we're continually learning and growing to be more like Jesus in Jesus' name and the way we think, the way we live. Okay. Here's my argument. Please understand it. It's like the book of Revelation. When five of the seven churches went, went wrong, when five of the seven churches went in error, what did the Lord Jesus do? Rebuke them, threaten to remove them if they didn't repent, and then remove them, right? Right? Are you with me there? Pay attention now to this argument. I need you to listen. When five of the seven churches went wrong in some area, the Lord Jesus directly rebuked them, told them to repent, and he removed them. So that tells you, tells you what? The Lord Jesus is actively involved in overseeing the affairs of the church, his spiritual body on earth, and guiding it in such a way that it doesn't embrace damnable heresy lest he removes it from his presence, right? Are you seeing that? Revelation chapter 2 and 3? Everyone get it, right? Okay, I need you to make sure you're listening so you know what my argument is. That tells me the Lord Jesus will work in such a way, the Lord Jesus is going to work in such a way that he will not allow the universal church, all Christians everywhere, to embrace unanimously or in unity Doctrines that are damnable, doctrines that contradict scripture, doctrines that grieve his Holy Spirit, because he'll make sure to intervene and save the universal church in all its quarters from agreeing on false teaching. You get my point? And where am I getting this from? From scriptures. It's based on sola scriptura. I'm using the scriptures. So then you Christians need to then wrestle with the church universally embraced water baptismal regeneration. The church universally embraced the perpetual virginity of Mary. The church universally embraced the Eucharist as the body, blood, soul of Christ. If that's the case, and these are damnable false doctrines, where was Jesus to stop them like he did to the five of the seven churches in Revelation? Do you understand my argument now? Do you understand? It has nothing to do with the Christians being infallible, inspired, and errant. It has everything to do with the sovereign trying God. He's almighty. He is faithful. He is true. Cannot lie. And he's faithful to what he said in scripture. And he'll not go against scripture. So I'm basing it on my trust of God in what he says in scripture that he'll be working in the church in such a way that the body universal, not just one segment or pocket here, churches universally embracing these doctrines in common. You understand now? So don't insult my intelligence. Don't insult me by telling me to say, well, we don't look to the fathers. They're not inerrant. Who said they were? Who said they were? But neither are you inerrant, infallible, neither I'm inerrant, infallible, neither are your churches. So what are you saying? Are you getting it now? Is it making sense? Now, I got someone keep Skyping me and distracting me. Let me see what he wants. Sorry, guys, because I'm not taking Skype calls now, but in, I'm going to have to do this because this guy won't stop calling. Hold on. I don't know who he is. Let's see who he is. If he's someone wasting my time, I'm going to block him. Kev Kevin Davis, it says.
I shut it down for a reason, but he keeps calling on my phone. Hold on, guys, because I want to go into Noah and baptism. Hold on, let me see. Let me see. Kevin, what's up? Hey, Sam, you told me to call you a half hour ago. Well, there's like 50,000 people that I'm always telling. Give me the context of our conversation. Uh, I, I sent you a, a message that said that I disagree with your reason. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're the guy that upset me from Canada. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you hear, did uh, so you hear Sam, what I said, brother? Hold on before you go on. You hear what I said, how someone can reach me and reason with me, not the way you did it? You heard that part? Because you're live on the air now. Do you know this? Friendship and being used of the devil. Yeah, well, you, you know you're live, right? And I'm going to have to put you in your place again. Because you're live okay. and this is recorded in my YouTube session. You know that, right, sure. Kevin Dennis? Right. I'm ready for that. Okay, did you hear me say in the beginning how to reach me instead of being a tool of the devil and causing me to, to stumble, right? Sorry, Sam. In the beginning of what? Of the session that I did. So you didn't listen to the session? You just decided to call me? No, you've asked me a couple times to call you. Yes, okay. So now, what, give me give me your first center. objection. Now, what's your first objection? Okay, so when someone when someone gives you sorry, you give someone a verse and they go to a different verse to answer. You say you're tap dancing. You're tap okay. dancing. Okay, you, you know you're going to get blocked because you are really a wicked tool of the devil. Don't okay. do the ad hominem because I'm going to embarrass you. No, no, what's your argument? It. Don't pontificate. Give me your objections. Or I'm going to send you back to Canada. A. Eh? What's your argument? <laughs> so, Sam, if you'll listen, okay. I, I'm asking you a question. You use a line of reason. Yep. Now, you tell me this guy's not an arrogant, wicked tool of the devil, a satanic bastard. You see his tone, right? You saw his tone? Do you see his tone? Arrogant, wicked, satanic bastard. And he wonders why. Hey, <laughs> Sam, I asked you a question. Okay, you see? He just proved my point. Kevin Davis from Canada. Thank you. Glory to Jesus. You're recorded now. You just proved my point. You saw that, right? Okay, hold on. All right. You saw that, right? What did I just say? An arrogant, satanic tool of the devil. An arrogant, satanic, demonic, spiritual bastard. And it, even the way he talks, you saw the arrogance? Yeah, yeah, and I got to another bridge. <laughs> <You're good. laughs> Fill up the devil, and he thinks he's a Christian. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Anyway, are we now back on topic? Messiah Christ. Can I give you another chance? No, I don't think so, Messiah Christ. Here, here. Bye, 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 my brother. Messiah, God bless you. Hope you find another channel that you like. All right. See, again, people don't learn. Yeah, Guys, let me let me share something else with you. I'm not looking to be aggravated. I'm not looking to get into a fight and cause people to stumble or they cause me to stumble. I'm not here for an ego fest and a clash of egos to see who's better, who can out talk someone. You guys still don't get it, right? Yeah. Thank you, Marceloni. Exactly. I know. By the power of the Holy Spirit, all glory to Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. I know when someone's coming in a very arrogant, nasty, fake spiritual manner where he thinks he's spiritual, humble, and Christ-like. Honestly, you heard it in his voice, right? You heard it in his voice, the arrogance, the nastiness, and this guy thinks he's a brother. I'm a brother. <laughs> All right. Lord Jesus, take over and crucify my flesh. Save us from, from stumbling. Are we now focused? Because we're going to go into meat. In fact, let me tell you how important this topic is. I had to write notes. Do you know why? So I don't miss anything. I had to take some notes here because these points are so important for you to get because you're going to be blown away. I had to take them down because obviously I trust Holy Spirit to guide the conversation. But there are times in which I get so much into a conversation. There are times in which I get so much in conversation. I end up not covering the points I had in mind. But this time I discipline myself. Ah. Surprise, David. Timmy, why are you doing this to me, Timmy? Timmy, why are you doing this to me, Timmy? All right, are we ready? Okay. Let me again, I want to glor glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. In all honesty, 
I have been freed. Let me tell you why. When I believed a particular understanding of salvation, when I was confronted with verses that didn't agree with that view that I inherited and I received, I had to explain those passages away, and they troubled me. Okay? One passage that caused me great trouble was 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21. Now, I don't know. The mods are here. Is Protestant here? Is first last here? Yeah, Ariel, be patient. We'll get there. I'd even ask if they were here, the guys that usually post for me. I guess they're not here. Okay, I'm going to have to do it. Guys, bear with me. Yeah, so bear with me. I'm going to have to do it. All right. So bear with me. Let me just do it because we don't have the brothers here. All right. Okay, let me do this. I'm going to just have to read out loud. So guys, forgive me. The mods are not here. That's what happens when you don't pay them. If you don't pay them, they come when they want. It's their world. I'm just a squirrel. All right. Here it is. First Peter 3, 20 to 21. Okay. I'm going to read it. New American Standard Bible. Bear with me. First Peter 3, 20 to 21. Just follow with me. I'm going to read. So you don't need to see the verses. I'm going to read them out loud until one of the mods get here. Dude, when you start paying me, Sergun, Khalio Lebu, Khalio Rishu, Sergun, Gabara, Gabara, area. When you start paying me, I'll pay them. All right. Yeah, let me show you. You listen to this. Okay. Let's read it. First Peter 3, 20, 21. Who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. Did you catch it? Brought safely through water. Because this is an evangelical translation, they render the Greek as brought safely through water. Okay. Note, note, your Bible versions will translate verses in ways that will agree with their particular understanding of the core doctrines of the Christian faith. Because this is an evangelical translation that does not believe water baptism saves. Notice that in New American Standard Bible, it says brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm now going to switch to the New King James Version because now I'm going to show you the difference. Okay, pay attention. Okay. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, New King James Version. While the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight, were saved through water. Did you notice the difference? Brought safely through water, were saved through water. Profound difference, isn't it? Here it is. New King James Version, Conchess, New American Standard Bible. Brother Aries, can you post or is that sister? I can't tell. Is that a sister or a brother? Were saved through water. Do you understand the difference? Brought safely through water doesn't have the impact. Of being saved through water because if you say they're saved through water it now connects with water baptism just like they were saved through water we are saved through water beloved i'll give you 10 million dollars you prove to me water baptisms a work see this is your ignorance and your protestantism that's embarrassing you beloved of god do you want to call me on skype where i'm going to destroy that argument water baptism is not a work it is what faith is. In other words, water baptism is an essential component of true faith. It is not separate from faith. It defines what faith is. You see, again, you're chiming. Instead of listening and learning, you're already debating me. You see? Don't you understand I've been where you're at? It's not simply an expression of faith, Zina. It is faith. Okay, my brother, my brother. That's not how you ask a question because be honest with me. You're coming off as argumentative. So we're saved by a work instead of asking me, well, Sam, I thought we're not saved by works. And isn't baptism a work? No, you already assumed it's a work. So we're saved by work. Come on now. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, beloved. Beloved of God. You know I love you, right? Been there, done, done that. You, know, you see how many T-shirts I've gotten so far, beloved of God. I'm going to go broke getting all these T-shirts. Come on, beloved of God. Beloved of God, I'm going broke. How many t-shirts do I'm going to get? Come on, dude. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Beloved of God, if you be patient, I promise you. I'm going to explain it where it will make sense to you. And this is after many years of agonizing over this issue. 
Caleb, it's ir irrelevant right now for the point. By or through doesn't make a whole load of difference because water baptism is what we call instrumental cause. Let me explain the difference here. Let me explain the difference for Brother Caleb. When you say through water, it means that water baptism is the instrumental cause. It's not the efficient cause. What do I mean? I don't mean this to sound fancy. Water baptism is not what saves you. It's God who saves you through what Jesus did. But that salvation is given to you through faith, repentance, and baptism. You see the point? So the means, the instrument, the instrument, the means by which you receive the salvation of God is faith, repentance, baptism. So that's why saying through water shows that it's not the cause of your salvation. You get the difference now? You guys want meat, right? It's not the cause of salvation. It's the means through which God grants to you the salvation that Jesus wrought by his perfect life and death. You see the difference? Mods, if you have people distracting or attacking or getting off topic, you know what to do. Right? Is that you understand now the difference? So let's not get hung up, but here, here it's it's much better than the New King James because why? Peter's making a connection with water baptism and the flood waters. Just like Noah was saved through water, we too are saved through baptism. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Water baptism saves us, according to Peter. But if you have a tradition that insists water baptism is a work and therefore cannot save you because Paul says you're justified or saved by faith, then you're going to have a hard time dealing with this passage and you're going to have to explain this passage other than its immediate apparent meaning. The plain reading, listen to me, I really need your attention. The plain reading, just reading it in Greek or English, this, this corresponds to baptism that now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but a pledge of a good conscience towards God. And it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Meaning, it's the resurrection of Christ that saves you, which makes baptism efficacious, right? The efficacious instrument, the effectual means of receiving that, re that salvation that comes from Jesus' resurrection. You with me there? Do you know why, Joe Sharp, my brother? Because ESV is done by evangelical scholars who, for the most part, are Calvinists. Tippy Bear, what if you had the desire to be baptized and you die having that desire? You think God's going to condemn you to hell? To no fault of your own, you had a desire to get baptized. You couldn't do so, but God saw you were not hesitant to get baptized. You wanted to get baptized for his glory. And you think, so say, well, too bad, Tippy. You want to get baptized. You didn't make it to the water. Darn it. I can't save you now. I got to send you to hell. Come on, sister. You know, I love you, right? But not that much. Can we stay focused now? Because I got to go slow. It's going to be me. Brethren, can you not bring up irrelevant issues such as infant baptism? You guys are bringing issues that you think are relevant, but it's going to make me go off topic. Focus, guys, please. Can you guys focus? Can you guys focus? No, it doesn't. Confidence. No, it doesn't. I'll get there. If you're patient, because you guys are not patient, you already want to debate. Patience. I haven't even gotten to the next point. I'm trying to walk through this. Okay. New King James captures it perfectly in my estimation. Okay, let me read it again. 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21. The reason why I'm not reading the King James, it is very hard because it's Shakespearean. It's very hard, and I don't want people to get confused. You know my position about the King James. So let's read it. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. Okay, let's first park it there. The water did not save Noah and his family, right? Because the water is what destroyed the earth. And Noah and his family had to be saved from being destroyed by the water by entering the ark. So is Peter wrong? Here's where you're going to get blown away. Honestly, if you're listening with an open heart, 
you're going to see how amazing this Bible is. And the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gave the apostle of our Lord is mind-blowing. And it's a wisdom that I only realized just recently by trying to understand the passage sincerely in context and not making an agree with a tradition that was given to me. Okay? Peter is inspired by the Spirit. And he says that no one in his family were saved through the water. No, they weren't, Peter. The water was going to destroy them. It's the ark that saved them. Is he wrong? No. You want to get ready? You want to be blown away? You guys want to get blown away? You ready now? And it only came to me recently when I just said, Holy Spirit, guide me to accept your word as it is. The water did save him. Why? Because why did God destroy the earth with, with the flood? Why did God destroy the earth by flood? Because he was destroying the earth of evil, of its wickedness. So the water saved Noah and his family from the corruption and evil of the earth. It did save them by destroying the earth of all its evil, right? And sparing Noah and his family from being contaminated by that evil. You catch it now? Ah, shut up, Chad. Chad. Shut up. Stop barking like a filthy satanic dog. You're too stupid to debate. You with me there? But now notice... It wasn't just the water, it was the ark. And the ark is a type of Christ. So now you guys want to get blown away? The water with the ark together saved Noah. And the ark is a type of Christ. So how does baptism correspond to that? When you are united to Christ in baptism, you are united to Jesus' death and resurrection. So you too are saved by the ark of the body of Christ and water. Did it sink in now? Did it sink in or no? No debate me right now. Just like the ark saved them in union with the water, likewise, water baptism only saves you because of Jesus' resurrection, 1 Peter 3.22, it saves you by the resurrection. Jesus' physical, bodily death and resurrection is what saves you. And you're united to Jesus' physical death and resurrection by water. See what Peter saw that I could not see because I inherited a tradition that told me baptism cannot save You got it or no? 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21. Let me read it now in context. And I'm going to give you now some meat. We're not done yet. Who well, formerly were disobedient when once divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience for God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Tie it in. Noah's family entered the ark and went through the waters to be saved from evil and corruption of the earth. The water destroyed the evil and the ark preserved them through the water, bringing them out into a new earth. Jesus' physical bodily death and resurrection saves you and you are united to his death and resurrection by water. And that union with Christ that takes place in water baptism destroys your evil, sinful flesh. Thank you, brother. You got it. Did everyone get it or no? Hey, Daydream, can you post from the New King James or no? Daydream, can you post from New King James or no? Because the other mods are not here. Let me see. Who can post King New King James? No, I'll just keep reading. I don't mind. Anyone can post New King James? I don't know why the other mods are not here today, but anyway. No, first last was going to do. Oh, here he goes. Hey, first last. 
Are you here? Praise God, brother, even though you're late for the game. You're always last. Can you post from the New King James? Praise the Lord. See, the brother quit his job. He's living by faith now. Okay, now, before you post, did you guys now understand the beauty and the depth of Peter's inspired words? Words. Jerry O'Sullivan, don't make me laugh, dude. You're going to get humiliated by misquoting Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 17. Can you stop? In fact, Jerry, you need to get out of here. Get him out of here. Get Jerry out of here for misquoting Paul in 1 Corinthians 1. He needs to get out of here because he's not listening. All right. Does it, you see the connection now? You see the insight, the wisdom, and the depth that Peter was given by the Spirit to make that connection? This, I, don't, I just want to see if you got it. If not, I don't want to move on. I'm going very slow, guys. So it sinks in by the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, can we not get into side talks about infant baptism? I'm going to start blocking more people. You guys are disrespecting me, Matthew Geisler. In fact, Matthew, you need to go too. Get Matthew Geisler out of here because he was disrupting earlier. He needs to go too. See? No respect. Matthew, bye-bye, brother. Take care. All right. Now let me confirm that by Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. No, I didn't say it wasn't, Zena. This is why, Zena, you need to stop watching your soap operas and go back. And I said it is water. Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Get it? The baptism is what unites us to Jesus' physical death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now pay attention to 5 and 6. 5 and 6. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Are you now making the connection with the flood story? Are you now making the connection? Noah and his family entered an ark that went through the water that saved them from the evil, the wickedness that had corrupted the earth. The water saved them from the corruption of the earth, destroyed the corruption of the earth. And then they embarked on a new earth. Similarly, we, by faith, when we turn to Christ and be baptized, that act of water baptism is where the Holy Spirit then unites us to Christ, destroying our old man, our sinful nature, raising us a new creation. Now it finally made sense to me. Now I finally got what Peter was saying. Finally. Do you know why I finally got it, guys? Do you know why I finally got it? Alex, I didn't make that connection either. Number one, if you're asking the Holy Spirit from your heart, Holy Spirit, guide me into all truth and save me from error and set me free and destroy my pride, not to insist I'm right, but to embrace, embrace your truth. He'll guide you. And then secondly, he'll show you those areas in which you're bound to traditions that you think are biblical and when he makes you aware of those errors, you let go, then your eyes open and you see clearly. The reason why I didn't see it before, get TV out of here. Get this dog out of here who keeps barking and won't stop. The reason why I didn't see it before, because I had bought into a particular understanding of what faith is. For example, HCJB just quoted Romans 10. I think it was you, right, brother? Let me see. Oh, Wentworth just quoted Romans 10, 8 to 13. He doesn't know it's going to backfire him and destroy his argument. Wentworth, do you want me to show you how Romans 10 refutes you and shows you don't know Scripture? Because you thought this is going to make your case against me? Is that why you're quoting it? Romans 10, verses 8 to 13. You think it's refuting me? Because I want you to say this, because now I'm going to show you how this passage destroys your tradition. And it's going to end up embarrassing you because you're not patient to learn. Wentworth, please tell me yes. I quoted this to show you're wrong. Can you tell me that, please? Make my day. Please, brother. Make 
my day. Wentworth, you're not going to respond. I'm going to block you. Hold on. Let me see what this is. Yellow? Who is this? Who are you? My name's Amber Powers. I was calling on behalf of Bible League International. Ma'am, can you? I'm doing. I'm doing a live teaching on the Bible right now. Could you call me in two hours? Absolutely. I'm so sorry. It's okay, ma'am. I just didn't know the number. I thought maybe it's one of my stalkers, and you're going to stalk me, and then I have to block you. But you're a sister in the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. God bless you. Take care. Bye -bye. God bless you as well. Bye bye. Hey, she's a sister in the Lord. She's from Bible League. I don't recognize the number. I'm panicking. All right. So once we're didn't respond, all right. Now, I'll get back to once, uh, Romans 10 in a minute. Everyone understand now the connection with the ark, the water, and Jesus' physical body, his physical resurrection and water baptism? You see how they all tie in? Is, is You see how it all ties in? Okay, because now get ready to be blown away. There's more. Are you ready now? Are you ready? Are you ready? Because now we're going to go to the Old Testament. And I'm going to show you how two individuals were saved by water and an ark, prefiguring Jesus' physical bodily death and resurrection and water baptism. Two individuals saved from death through water and an ark, both of which prefigure Jesus' physical, bodily, death, and resurrection because he's the true ark of God and water baptism. Are you ready? You ready? Okay. Genesis 8, verses 4 to 12. Exactly, Philip Mears. You see, Philip Mears, when you let go of tradition and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you on truth and not insist your tradition is right, how everything comes to life and blows your mind. Genesis 8, verses 4 to 12. Guys, read with me. Read with me. Then the ark, and by the way, the same word ark is used elsewhere in reference to Moses. It's the same Hebrew word. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the seventh day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains, the tops of the mountains. <clears throat> Don't buy too fast, brother. Hold on. We're seen. Verse 6. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. So he wanted to know if there was dry land. So he sent a raven out. Raven kept coming back. Now watch here, 8 to 12. The ark, and that same word, sabba, I'm going by memory, but I have it in my notes, is used in one other place in reference to Moses. We're going to get there. Okay, but pay you guys, please pay attention. I promise you, you're going to be blown away and stand in awe how deep God's word is. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. Verse 8. He also sent out from himself a dove. Notice water, ark, dove. Water, ark, dove. Please remember that. Water, ark, dove. Okay. To see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. Water, Ark dove. Okay. Listen now. Verse 9. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out of the ark, uh, from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked Olive leaf was in her mouth. Olive leaf, an olive tree. And if you read the Pentateuch, oil of anointing was olive oil. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove. Sent out the dove. Okay. Which did not return again to him anymore. Now, notice what happened. Sent out a dove. The dove came with an olive leaf, olive tree. Then seven days later, sent out the dove. The dove did not return. So then Noah came out of the ark. Okay. Noah came out of the ark. Pay attention now. 
ark, water, olive leaf. Noah now comes on, on dry ground on a new earth. Ark, water, dove, olive tree, new creation, a new earth. Okay, Mark 1, verses 9 to, to, to 11. Mark 1, verses 9 to 11. Watch here. Let's see who's going to catch it. Mark 1, verses 9 to 11. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came forth from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he comes out of the water, he saw the heaven parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from him, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus comes out of the water. Spirit comes down upon him as a dove, signifying the beginning of the new creation. Water, dove, the Holy Spirit, a dove, Jesus, the one who now inaugurates the new creation as he comes out of the water and works with the Holy Spirit to bring about the new creation. Yep, he was anointed as well. Olive leaf anointing. Olive oil anointing, and the Holy Spirit came down and anointed him. Let me give you a minute for it to sink in. That's why the demons are going to start manifesting now. All right. Everyone got it? Exactly. That was the other point I was going to be, bring. Notice the connection with Noah, water, dove, and a new earth. Just like Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2, you had the initial earth, the initial creation, as a watery substance and the Holy Spirit hovering over it. Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2. Are you seeing the pattern in, in the Bible that in every step of the Bible, God connects the Holy Spirit, and water with creation. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, the earth was a watery mass and the Holy Spirit was hovering over it to take that watery mass and shape it and make it habitable. Then comes the flood, destroying the earth that had been corrupted and evil, and then comes out Noah out of an ark after the dove <clears throat> did not return, signifying by the dove it's safe now to embark on this new earth. And then we come to Mark 1. The Holy Spirit appears as a dove as Jesus comes out of the water, tying in the flood and the initial creation of Genesis 1. <sighs> Not necessarily, Louisa. That's why the raven was not the bird that signified it was safe for Noah to embark on the new earth, but a dove. And why do you think the Holy Spirit then appears as a dove? He deliberately appeared as a dove to remind you that it was the dove that signified for Noah and his family, it's now safe to embark on a new earth because the evil has been purged and destroyed by the water. Before I move on to the next point, I want it to sink in. I got more. See, I have to take notes to make sure that every point we cover. I got to cover every point. Sonny, are you here too? Let me see. And it's the same word in Hebrew for ark. Here, ark, used for Noah's ark. Same word used for what happened to Moses. I just got to make sure I get every point because I cannot, cannot ignore any of these points. Okay. Let's go now. Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. Yeah, Warren, crossing the Red Sea signified they were released from bondage and entering into a new land. It's all connected, Warren. And Warren Arthur, you know who connects it? Paul does in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. Okay, now Exodus 1, 22. Pay attention, guys. Second connection. Water ark escaping death. Water ark escaping death. Water ark escaping death. Okay, pay attention now. Exodus 1, 22. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Everyone who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Water ark being saved from death. Okay, now, Exodus 2, verses 1 to 10. 
Same Hebrew word ark used of Noah is now used of Moses. Pay attention. Let's see if you catch it. Pay attention, guys. And a man of the house of Levi went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. Pay attention. Guys, I need you to pay attention now. Right? So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him. That's the same Hebrew word, ark. Dabbed it with asphalt and pitch. But the child in it, put the child in it. Okay. Sorry about that because this, this, the comments are going too fast. That's why I'm going to have to fire first and last. Put the child in it. Sorry about that. And laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. Verse 4. And a sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. When she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew woman, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Now notice 9 and 10. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I'll give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Now notice 10. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. He had to go through the water in an ark to save death. And he came out of the waters unto life. Why does it have to be there, confidence? Every place has to have a dove? Everywhere? I'm sorry, confidence. Hold on. Let me call Moses. Confidence in Christ's ministry. Let me call Moses. Hold on. Moses, what's up? How are you, Joshua, doing in heaven? My friend is upset. Confidence? Well, hold on. Let me finish my point. Well, I'm not debating you. You know I can't win in a debate with you. My friend's upset that in Genesis you mentioned a dove, but when you were drawn out of the water, you didn't mention a dove. Why, Moses? What's going on? Hello? See? Because of you, he hung up on me. Confidence, now I got to block you. You got him upset. He didn't want to answer my question. He's like, dude, are you serious? And he hung up. All right. Why, every, every event has to have a dove? Timmy, Timmy, why you do the to me, Timmy, Timmy, why you do the to me, Timmy? All right. Okay. Like Noah, Moses was saved through water in an ark from death. Like we are saved through water. In the ark of the Lord Jesus, his physical body, whose death and resurrection saves us and destroys our old man in union with him. Now, we're not going to read it, but I'm going to give you another chapter to blow you away. Another chapter that I had to explain away, but I'm going to give it to you. We're not going to read it. I'm just going to give it to you and sum it up. Are you guys ready now? Write 2 Kings chapter 5. Yes, exactly, Asna, because then the Red Sea. Excellent, Asna. See, now you're seeing it, right, Asna? Now the Holy Spirit is giving you lessons, lenses from the Holy Spirit to now see all these truths in Scripture. Yes, Arthur. Another one, 2 Kings 5. You can read verses 1 of 14. One that I had to explain away. One that the church fathers used. Church fathers used to show... The salvific nature of water baptism. Naaman, Naaman, the Syrian general, the general of the army of Syria, had heard about Elisha and that he was a miracle worker. And he had leprosy, right? Leprosy. So he went there and Elisha sent a servant to say, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. He dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River came out and his skin was fresh like a baby. 
Notice seven, the number of perfection. Jordan River, the very river that Joshua crossed, the very river that John the Baptist baptized our Lord Jesus in. So, folks, if you're going to insist water baptism has no role to play in salvation, you're going to have problems with these passages like I did. And I'm confessing. Because of the tradition I inherited that said water baptism is antithetical to salvation in that faith alone saves and water baptism is not part of faith, I didn't know what to do with all these passages. I had to explain them the way, explain them away. Honestly, now I am free. But my freedom means I want to have Protestants who are now going to attack me, say I'm a heretic. I've abandoned the faith I once professed. That's what James White did. He put a tweet because that's that's what he does. I love him. He's my brother in Christ. I mean him no disrespect. But he put a tweet without mentioning my name. A former friend who has now abandoned the faith he once professed. I abandoned the faith I once professed professed no i abandoned your man-made tradition and now i'm on the side of the faith of the early church i'm on the side of the faith of the early church i'm on athanasius's side i'm on justin martyr's side i'm on Irenaeus' side i'm on tertullian's side and ignatius and polycarp and even augustine i'm on their side on this issue i'm on the side of the council of nicaea Yes, he is the living waters. Exactly. He gives living waters. Esna, you're making the connection. Right? Now, honestly, letting go of shackles and traditions, how much beauty, depth, and miraculous consistency are you seeing in this pattern? How God from the beginning has used the water in union with the Holy Spirit to create initial creation, water, and the Spirit. The new earth destroyed by water, as known as family saved in the ark, would prefigure the body of Christ. And a dove symbolizing they can now embark on the new earth. Later on, the New Testament picks up on that imagery and says that dove symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Jesus coming out of the water. The Spirit comes down on Jesus as a dove, connecting the initial creation and the new earth that was destroyed by flood with Jesus' work of ushering in a new creation. Asterisk, that's, come on, brother. You know I love you, right? Asterisk, why would you use that example? You're hurting me. I've answered that millions of times. Asterisk, do you really, seriously, so, uh, be honest with me. The man on the cross is nailed. Do you really expect that God de would demand, hey, take him off the cross, soldiers. Dip him in water and put him back on the cross again. Are you serious, man? Come on, my brother, asterisk. You're a brother in Christ, and God has given you common sense. Why would you expect a guy hanging on the cross is about to die to get baptized? God can save any way he wants, and he can make exceptions. And for that person, the Lord made exception because of his circumstances. But according to you, hold on. Hey, Centurion, come here. Get over here. Get over here. Get him down. Now, dip him in that river. Put him back up. Okay, now you can go to heaven. Seriously? Is that what you expect? <laughs> I'm losing it, dude. You're breaking Sam Shamoon. You broke me. You broke me, Timmy. Timmy. They broke me, Timmy. Timmy. Oh, Timmy. They broke me. Manifest. Yes, Joey. The blood and the water from the side of Jesus represents his blood that cleanses you. And the water symbolizes the Holy Spirit, the living waters that gives you life. In fact, here, asterisk. Doesn't Hebrews 9.27 say, Hebrews 9.27 say, 
It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So how many times do men die? Asterisk. How many times do men die? Exactly, Sophie. God bless you, sister. No, no, we're not talking about we're talking about physical death born again. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, Timmy, I'm sorry. These guys put me in my place. They're more biblical than me. Because there's true, people can die twice. They got me there. But Timmy, you know where they didn't listen? Hebrews 9 27, Timmy, it said, It is appointed for man to die once. So the people that said tw twice, they said Hebrews is wrong. Booyah! Okay, let's try this again. How many times? Does a man die? Hebrews 9, 27. I even quoted it. It is appointed for man to die once. And after that comes the judgment. All right. How many times do men physically die? Asterisk. Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed for man to die once. And after that comes the judgment. Okay. But now asterisk, if you're listening. Lazarus died twice physically. He died the first time physically, was resurrected, and died a second time physically. The widow's son died twice physically. He died the first time physically, was raised by Jesus, only to die again physically. Jairus is died. In other words, you cannot take passages that speak about the general way that God does things, right, and then sub subjugate them to the exceptions. This is how God generally operates. But there are exceptions. The exceptions are not the norm. It's the general way that God does things that are the norm. Normally, men die once physically. But God has raised people to die again. Those are exceptions. Likewise, the thief on the cross is an exception. Even in Hebrews 11.5, it says Enoch didn't die. He's an exception, Hebrews 11.5. Same Hebrews in Hebrews 11.35 says that women received their, their children back from the dead. An exception. They died and was raised to die again. Don't look to the exceptions and assume they are the norm. Look to the pattern, the general way God does things. That's the norm. Is that clear? Everyone got it or no? It's out, dude. I, I need to block you. What do you want, dude? Don't waste my time, right? Because now the final point of Noah and his ark, and we're going to segue into another topic. Final point of Noah and his ark. Asterisk, uh, you got to go. You know that, right, Asterisk? You got to go because of your impatience, you can't be here anymore because you're not learning. So God bless you, brother. Take care. All right. Final example, right? He's got to go because he's not listen, listening. All right. I'm going to explain to you that faith does not exclude baptism. Faith, properly defined, includes turning, confessing, and being baptized. All right? I'm going to show you that. But because he's not patient, he's got to go. Guys, my channel is not going to be for everyone. It's not going to be for people who are impatient, know-it-alls, who think they are chiefs and want to pontificate. This channel is not for you. Move on. Because if you're patient and not being pricked by the demons to try to argue, I'm going to show you that baptism is part and parcel of faith. So it is faith that saves you. But that faith that saves is defined by the Bible as turning to Christ, confessing him as Lord, and being baptized. That is faith. But you guys are not patient. Timmy, Timmy, why you do this to me, Timmy? All right, are we ready? Final part about Noah's Ark. Again, here's the notes. Okay, here it is. Let's go to Genesis 6 and read 14 and 15. Now, I'm going to give you the links to the Hebrew so you can see it. Genesis 6, 14 and 15. Okay, read with me. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Guys, pay attention to the word wood. Wood of gopher, wood. Pay attention to that. Guys, I need you to pay attention. Pay attention to gopher wood, specifically the word wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it. Pay attention to the word cover it. 
inside and outside with pitch. So if you underline or highlight your Bibles, underline wood, cover it, pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits with 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. Okay. So Genesis 6.14 in the King James now. Genesis 6.14 in the King James. Here's the words I want you to underline. Okay. Make the, the an ark of gopher wood. Wood. Underline wood. Programmer, you don't like it. Shut up and go to hell. You don't like it, right? See? Anyway. Make the an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark and shalt pitch it. Pay attention to pitch it. Yep, Angie. I'm getting there. Just wait a second. Pitch it within and without with pitch. Pay attention to wood. Pitch it. Shall pitch it. Shall pitch. Underline shall pitch and pitch. Wood shall pitch and pitch. Okay. Here it is. And I'm going to give you the link. The word for shall pitch. Let me see if I can read. It's wa kaparta. Wa kaparta from kafar. Wa kaparta shall pitch. The word kafar. That's the word used for making atonement. This word kafar is used elsewhere for making atonement. Exodus 32 verse 30. Yep. Exodus 32 verse 30. Watch here. Shall pitch. Exodus 32, verse 30. You can use the New King James if you want, brother, but it's okay. And it came to pass on the, mor the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Perhaps, peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. Make an atonement. That's from the same word, kafar. You shall pitch. Wa kaparta. Kafar. In other words, the ark is functioning as a type of atonement. This word is also used in Leviticus 17, verse 11. Leviticus 17, verse 11. Cole, I'm not interested in, remar in marrying you. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life, the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement. Guess what the word atonement is? For your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Make atonement. Kafar, the same word, guys. Did you catch it? You shall pitch. The word shall pitch. Nwakaparta from kafar. That's the word used elsewhere to make atonement for sin. Did you get that part, Luis and everyone else? Did you get that part? It says, you shall pitch. What are you going to pitch it with? You're going to pitch it with pitch. What's the word for pitch? The word pitch is koper from kofir, kofir, kofir. Sorry for butchering. I butcher English. That word, you shall pitch it with pitch. Kaper from kofir, kofir. That word is the word used for the price to ransom a life. It's the word used for the ransoming of a life. The payment to ransom a life. So when it says you shall pitch, and what you're going to pitch it with is pitch, the word pitch that he's going to pitch it with is the word used in the Bible for the price that you pay to redeem or ransom a life. Here, Job 33, verse 24, New King James. Job 33, verse 24, New King James. Bucker, do I need to block you for that question? It's the ark that's going to save Noah from destruction. The ark is functioning as a type of atonement. 
covering Noah and his family of their sin so they can escape the destruction. What do you mean, how does it apply? It's right there. Job 33, 24. Here, Job is asking for a mediator. He's asking for a mediator. And he's saying, perhaps there's an angel, someone who can mediate. That's okay, brother. Just pay attention. It's self-explanatory. Then he is gracious to him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Guys, guess what that word for ransom is? That word for ransom is the word where we get pitch from. You shall pitch it with pitch. Same word for ransom. The ransom you pay to redeem a life, to release a life from death. <whistles> kafir, kafir. Kafar, kafir, kafir. Final example, Psalm 49, verse 7. Psalm 49, verse 7. No, brother, I don't have these notes. I just wrote them here to remind myself to make sure to go over them because when I start live, sometimes I go in tangents. So I want to make sure. None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. Notice the word ransom. No man can give God the ransom to save his life from destruction. So did you see both words refer to making atonement and offering God the ransom price to ransom someone from death? The very words used to seal the ark. In other words, the ark is functioning as a type of atonement for Noah and his family, covering them over so they can es escape destruction. Shalom Chavarim, Shalom Chavarim, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom Chavarim. Did it sink in or no? Do you see how everything is pointing to Jesus Christ? The floodwaters, the ark, the dove. The new earth points to the work of Jesus Christ in unitary spirit in bringing about a new creation. Is it is it clear? Or you guys are still confused? There was another reason why he walked on where Caleb David. That was a sign that he is the Lord God Almighty who's sovereign over the winds and the waves, who tames the seas and will save you from the storms of your life from the storms of your life if you focus on him and look to him before i move on to some other points i want to make sure you're getting it if you're not getting it i won't move on luis are you there too are you getting it I just, I'm giving a minute because I don't want to move on because there's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. All right. <sighs> He's not a kidnapper. Okay. All right. Now, let me explain to you that if you now let the Bible define what faith is, if you now let the Bible define what faith is, instead of Receiving a tradition that tells you what faith is and isn't. There is no contradiction with Paul saying you're justified by faith alone, saved by grace through faith alone, and water baptism saving you. There is no contradiction. Can I not show you? There is no contradiction. Can I show you? Are you not ready for that element? Finally, it dawned on me. I was walking to burn some calories. And the light switch went on. The light switch went on. I was defining faith a certain way that <clears throat> hindered me, didn't allow me from seeing faith as the act of turning to Christ, calling on his name, and being baptized for his sake. All of that is faith. It is faith. Because I was given a definition of faith that put water baptism in the category of working. Are you with me there? Because of the tradition I inherited, 
I define baptism as working, as opposed to being definitional to what true faith is. Okay, so are you now ready? Let's embark on this journey. If I'm right, okay, now, St. Polycarp, if I show you it's not working, will you admit that I'm a rabid, demonic bastard and a, and a dog of the devil because I'm stupid and I think I know what I'm talking about? Or I'll do that for you. And I'll embarrass you with pleasure. Would you do that? Would you admit? Will you say, no, but I'm going to have you call me and say, I am a demonic bastard. I'm a stupid dog being used of the devil. Okay, good. So now let's go. You said it, right? Okay. Let's go to Romans 3, 25 and 28. Romans 3, 25, 28. Now get ready, St. Polycarp. It's sad that you even have that name insulting the legacy of that great martyr. Okay, now read with me. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Through faith, right? No, for 325 and 28, not 228. You're being a good boy, but not enough. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. A man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. See right there, Paul is clear. Okay, folks, now get ready. Are you ready? I'm now going to show you from the same Paul, from the same epistle, faith for Paul is calling on the name of Jesus, turning to Jesus and being baptized. That is all faith, and it's not working. Okay, let me prove it to you. You ready? R Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. You ready? Get ready now. Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, St. Polycarp. Here it says you got to confess verbally, audibly, in order to be saved and justified, not just faith. Is Paul contradicting himself? And then Romans 10, 13. Romans 10, 13. So wait, St. Polycarp, how can it be faith alone when he says you must believe and call on Confess verbally. Here it is, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How can it be faith without works when he's saying you got to do something? You got to open your mouth and say something audibly, verbally before others. Because for Paul... Calling on the name of Jesus, verbally and confessing, is not a work. It is faith. It is definitional to faith. Here we go again. Okay, get this dog out of here. This dumb, stupid, demonic tool of the devil. Get him out of here. This stupid, dumb, satanic bastard. For everyone else, are you getting it? Paul, in order not to contradict himself... Must be defining faith as including confessing and calling on Jesus. You with me there? Unless you want Paul to contradict himself. It's not a meritorious act, Philip. Let me again explain so you get it. For Paul not to contradict himself. For Paul not to contradict himself. For him, faith must be inclusive of calling on the name of Jesus, confessing with your mouth. That is what faith is if he's not to contradict himself. Okay, there's more. There's more. Let's go to Acts 26, 18. Show down, sh shadow, I'm not going to show you. I'm going to block you too because baptism is what faith is. You don't get baptized, you don't have faith. You're still not getting it. Acts 26, 18. Jesus speaking to Paul. Listen. Jesus speaking to Paul. Sansom, you, you need to get out of here, buddy. Get the hell out of here. I don't want you here. I just explained it's not a work. It is faith. But you still ask me that question. 
to open their eyes in order to turn. That's what repentance is. What is repentance? To turn, change of mind, change of heart, change of action. Turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Did you catch it? Faith is repenting towards Christ. So faith is not separate. I'm sorry. Repentance is not separate from faith. Repentance is what faith is. It is turning toward Christ and believing in him. So the repentance towards Christ is what faith is. Did you see it? And Catholic Defender's not getting it either. Why is it so hard for these guys to get it? It's un unbelievable. If you say their actions, they're going to misunderstand you, Catholic Defender, and say, see, you're saying works. My brother, I'm helping you to avoid that debate. Don't use terms that they're going to misunderstand, misinterpret, misapply. Instead of saying actions, oh, actions works. Say, this is what faith is. Faith is repenting towards Christ, calling on his name and being baptized. That is faith. Leave it at that. I'm trying to help you avoid the, 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 the attacks Hey, oh, so you're adding works, works, brother. You're adding works, brother. You're adding works, brother. Okay. Now let me further prove to you. Okay. Can you listen to me so you can get it? Let me further prove to you repentance, the act of turning to Christ in faith, is not a work. It is what faith is. Can I prove it now to you? More proof? Acts 26 19 to 20. Acts 26, 19 to 20. Same Acts. Look what Paul says. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those, to Damascus and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Did you catch it? Repent, turn to God, and then do, do works to prove your repentance. He didn't class classify repentance as a work. Repentance is what faith is. You repent and turn to God in Christ to believe, and that's what faith is. And he goes, now prove repentance by your works, separating repentance from works. No, again, Arthur Lewis. I'm about to give up, dude. I'm about to give up. Arthur, how many times I'm going to insist it is not faith wor working through works. These so-called works are faith. When you keep setting that dichotomy, you're setting yourself up for refutation. Still not getting it. However, the Bible defines it, Alex. Does the Bible define repentance, calling on the name of Jesus, and baptism as faith that's distinct from working for your salvation? So, Alex, how does Paul and the other New Testament writers define faith? What is faith to them? So that means, Alex, you agreed with me. That means repentance, calling on the name of Jesus, and being baptized are not works done for salvation. They are true faith that saves. That's my point. Is everyone getting how I'm defining faith now? You're getting it? Where does baptism fall in? Okay. Is baptism a work? No. Let me prove it to you. Are you ready? Baptism is not considered a work. Like repentance and calling on the name of Jesus... It is faith. It is what faith is, separate from working for your salvation. Are you getting it? Because I don't want to go to the next line of evidence if you're not getting it. Exactly, beloved of God. I came out of that tradition, kicking and screaming, beloved of God. I came out of that tradition. You need to be patient, not me, because you guys are the ones who are impatient and attacking me. 
So may God give you patience. Let me make the point. So you guys need the patience because you're jumping and attacking. I understand your dilemma, but be patient. Listen. Are you not ready? Okay, let's go through this again. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Read here. Yes, Razzles, it is necessary for salvation. Are you listening or you just came on after your soap opera with Zena, watching soap operas? Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth that the, uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your hearts, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So faith is believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and calling on Jesus' name, confessing Jesus as Lord, believing he's Lord, and verbalizing it. Romans 10, 13. Watch here. Pay attention. Don't get into side debates. Let me make the point. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, pay attention. Calling on the name of the Lord Jesus is confessing Jesus as Lord verbally. It says with your mouth. It's got to be verbal, audible. And you do that because you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Now, baptism. Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. Pay attention now. Please don't debate me. Let me finish the point. Then we can get into questions. Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. Watch here. Or do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? I have to be united to Christ to be made alive spiritually, a new creation. So when am I united to Christ? At baptism. Watch. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall in, be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now watch this six. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So now notice, baptism, being baptized, that act of baptism is what then baptizes you into Christ by the Spirit, uniting you to Christ and being raised a new creation. Okay. Baptism, calling on the name of Jesus, confessing with your mouth, he's Lord. Repentance. Now let's see this in Acts 22, 16. Acts 22, 16. Now let's see if you see it. Acts 22, 16. Ananias to Paul. Ananias to Paul, Acts 22, 16. And Ananias says to Paul, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There you have it, all the elements together. Call on his name, be baptized, and your sins will be washed away. Wow, it's right there. Put it again, Acts 22, 16. Right there, folks. There you go. Read it. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So here's the elements. Baptizing, calling on the name of the Lord, having your sins washed, because that's what faith is that saves you. And to answer the question, can I ask you guys a question? Again, we said it's not good deeds. Adrian, do I need to block you for that? How many times will I have to tell you these are not good works that you do for salvation. It is what faith is. Okay. I don't know how many times I got to repeat myself. I'm getting tired. Okay. Guys, did Paul not believe in Jesus already when Jesus appeared to him? When Jesus appeared and blinded him and Jesus told him that I am Jesus of Nazareth, Paul already believed, right? Because Jesus said in Acts 9 to Ananias, he is praying and he's seen you come to him, right? So he already saw Jesus and believed, right? Luisa? But he still wasn't forgiven and saved until he got baptized. Why? 
Acts 22, 16. How come seeing Jesus, talking to Jesus, believing in Jesus, he still wasn't saved until Ananias came and he got baptized and called on Jesus' name? That's when he was saved. Acts 22, 16. Okay, Adrian, word it correctly because you're going to have Protestants attacking you. Not, it's not the plus sign, Adrian. It's the equal sign. Faith equals. Alan, you know I'm going to block you because I just answered that 40 minutes ago. You know that, right? You need to get out of here because that means you're coming in midstream. You didn't listen from the beginning. I already answered that 40 minutes ago. It's not the plus sign. It's the equal sign. Faith equals these acts. Adrian, you need to get out of here. I don't care what you agree. You need to prove it. Call me on Skype and prove it or I'm going to block you. Get out of here. I don't agree with it. Muslims don't agree with me either. Stupid, dude. Anyway. That's why you'll have passages where faith isn't mentioned. Acts 2, 37, 38. Acts 2, 37, 38. Exactly, Joe Sharp. You're getting it. Acts 2, 37, 38. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There you go. Calling on the name of Jesus, being baptized for his sake, turning to him and calling on his name, being baptized. Notice he doesn't mention faith because that is faith. Notice he didn't mention faith because the repenting, turning to and being baptized for the sake of Jesus on behalf of his name, that is faith. And Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You got it? Yes. Well, it's the Acts of the Apostles wrought by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. You caught it there? What shall we do, man? Repent. Turn. And be baptized for the sake of Christ by the authority of Christ, acknowledging the name of Christ. And this is why you're doing it for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Joel, I'm having a hard time. Why you bring up a question not related to the topic? And I need to block you. Now, let me show you what Peter did and how he explained. Joel 2.32. Let me show you. Let me show you now what Peter did. Let's go to Acts 2, 16 and 21. Acts 2, 16 and 21. Pay attention here. Acts 2, 16 and 21. Guys, no comments. Read. 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 Look what Lisa said. Puzzle pieces all fitting together finally by the power of the Spirit. And it finally fit for me, Luisa. Even Protestants have traditions they need to die to. But out of their stubbornness, they make the Bible agree with their traditions, which is why they have problems with these passages and need to explain away, like James White and Matt Slick do, like I used to. Acts 2, 16 to 21. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I'll pour out of my spirit and all flesh. This is Peter quoting the prophecy. Notice. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Now watch here. Watch here. 18. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now notice 21. And it shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's look at what Peter quoted again. Peter quotes Joel 
Quote Acts 2.21. Acts 2.21. Stefan, are you talking to me? Do you want me to send you out of here? Why are you here? You don't like the way I explain it. Why are you here for the love of God? Acts 2.21. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So notice Peter quotes at, in Acts 2.21. He quotes Joel 2.32, telling the Jews, God said you need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Notice his explanation of it. Notice his explanation of it. Acts 2.38. Hold on, let's see who this is. Hello? Hello? Hi, congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Congratulate me later. Notice how he explains Joel 232. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Guys, notice. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now guys, I'm confused. Peter, you quoted Joel 232. It says, Call on the name of Jesus to be saved. You catch it? Why then did you tell the Jews, repent, turn, and be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ? The prophecy says, call on the name of Yahweh. You're now defining and interpreting to mean you need to turn and be baptized for the sake of the name of Jesus. Then you'll be forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, fulfilling Joel 2.32. You, you caught it or no? Okay, get SO out of here, please. SO smooth. Please. He's advertising for other people. Everyone got it now? So according to Peter and Paul, what is calling on the name of Yahweh? What is to believe in Yahweh? For them, to believe on Yahweh, calling on his name, is to turn to Christ, calling on the name of Christ, Confessing Christ as Yahweh and being baptized for his sake in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That is what saves you. That is the faith that saves apart from works. That is faith. Now I'm going to give you an analogy with circumcision. I'm going to give you an analogy with circumcision. The New Testament likens water baptism with circumcision. Colossians 2, 11 to 12. Why do you want to call me, Frederick? What do you want with me? You want me to block you? Colossians 2, 11 to 12. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Did you catch it? You were buried with him in baptism and raised to new life by faith in Christ, raised as a new creation, spiritually circumcised. So you see how circumcision and baptism are tied together? You caught it? Physical circumcision typifies physical baptism because both circumcision and baptism Point to being regenerated, a new creation, being spiritually circumcised of your evil. Everyone got that? Before I move on? Because now I'm going to tie it in with Abraham. Romans 4, verses 1 to 3. Romans 4, verses 1 to 3. Guys, pay attention now because I'm going to end it with this point. We're going to go to something else. The icing on the cake. Everyone, Luisa, everyone listen. Romans 4, verse 1 to 3. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Scripture say, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So Abraham believed and was reckoned righteous, right? Now let's read verses 4 and 5. Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Okay? 
But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies ungodly, his faith is accounted, is accounted for righteousness. So you don't work to be justified. You have faith to be justified. Now watch the role of circumcision. Romans 4, verse 11. Romans 4, verse 11. Guys, pay attention. Abraham, who was justified by faith, not by works. Here's where I need you to pay attention. We're going to post it more than once so you can get it. Romans 4, verse 11. And he, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Did you catch it? Circumcision was the seal of faith, the sign and seal of faith, proving he had true faith. Did it sink in or no? Andre, why are you a stupid demonic bastard who thinks that you represent the Orthodox Church, but you're a tool of the devil and you're a filthy dog of the devil, Andre? Get the hell out of here. You joke. You slime. Disgrace to the Orthodox Church, you pig. You caught it? The circumcision wasn't so much a work as it was a seal and a sign. It sealed the faith, showing this is true faith, and the sign he had faith. And that's water baptism. Water baptism is the seal, right? Proving that you have the faith that saves, and it's a sign that you have the faith that saves. You got it now? Hope that sunk in. This is where I'm at. If I'm wrong, Lord Jesus, save me from these errors in mercy, not in wrath. Save them from my mistakes and show me where I'm wrong. This is my journey. This is where I'm at now. You don't agree with me? That's okay. You can go to another channel. Don't come here and debate me. Call me because you're not going to refute me. I'm not being honest. Not because I'm being arrogant. I know what you believe. I believed it for a while. So forget about it. Now, with that said, can we move on to something else? Alexandrina, you are stupid, filthy tool of the devil. Guys, why are you letting these people come here? And distract you like tools of the devil, like yours truly. You know, he's here to get sympathy because he's a tool of the devil trying to get attention. Get him out of here. Don't fall for the snares of the devil. Come on, guys. Wake up. Is that clear? Is that clear or no? Did it sink in before I move on to something else? Get rid of the demonic distractions, guys. Frederick, your impatience is going to get you out of here, dude. You're going to get out of here because you're not patient, my brother. All right. If that's clear, someone had a question about Jesus and the law. So I'll call him. No, uh, Danny, I'm not interested. Don't email me. Don't waste my time. Please, brother, don't be a stumbling block. Go back, listen from the beginning. Don't, because I've already been watching. In fact, here, I'll, I'll show you a great debate. This debate, I thought, the man the schooled Matt Slick. Church of Christ, who thinks we're all heretics, we're all going to hell, because we belong to false churches. But it was a debate on water baptism. And I'm going to bring him on my YouTube channel, if he's willing to come, to make a case for water baptism, regeneration. He debated Matt Slick, and he schooled Matt Slick, showing that Matt Slick really didn't know the subject. And Matt Slick, again, is very animated. And he can be very rude and disrespectful and nasty, just like me. So I'm not complaining. I got beams in my eyes. I'm just hoping when I debate him, he won't be like that because it's not going to go well for him. So, Danny, why are you then sending me a, a link to, to the, something I already know, dude? Why are you wasting my time? All right. Now, with that said, are we ready now to move on to a question that a brother has been waiting to ask me? Are you ready? Are you going to be distracted? Let's say distract us. We had close to 500 
We're losing people. I hope I'm not distracting you guys. You're getting bored. Or I can just shut down and come back another time. It's up to you guys. All right. And guys, mods, please control the text. Don't let people come here looking for sympathy, being used of the devil to distract. Please, guys. Please. In Jesus' name, may they keep coming for your glory, Lord. People who want to hear and not debate. Oh, here we go again. Oh, my goodness. Let me find this, brother. Jesus said the Lord. I'm going to come back to types and anti-types. Hey, what's happening? Hello. Can you hear me? Beautiful. Beautiful sound, brother. Uh, say it again. I couldn't hear you cutting out. What? Okay. All right. So, can you hear me now? Can you hear me or is it cutting out? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Okay, so keep talking to make sure where you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, I can still hear you. My check is it good. Oh, by the way, guys, uh, in about 40 minutes, God willing, James White and Dr. Jeff Riddle are debating on the authenticity of Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. So in 40 minutes, God willing, and I want to watch it. So Lord willing, uh, we'll be done before that. But go ahead. Go ahead, ask me a question. Okay, you can hear me? You want to repeat it five more times so I can hang up, brother? Go ahead, say it five more times. <laughs> okay, all right. So it was because you had told somebody previously that it might be like 527 to 28. No, the entire section, not just where those Jesus is. The entire section, he keeps saying, you have heard it was said, but I say. I just use 27, 28 as some of the examples. Because if you keep reading from 21 down, he does that all throughout. And then not only that, but from chapter 6 to 7, he goes on and issues commands and injunctions and warnings, right? So the Sermon of the Mount, the section on the law and the prophets it ends in matthew 7 so if you keep reading to 7 is jesus simply reiterating the law and the prophets or he's completing them and he's issuing commands and instructions for his community i don't know if you can hear me are you there yeah so but, what's, what's the I mean, delay in responding kind of what i'm saying though is he's not like negating the law of Moses, he's... You, are, you're obviously not hearing me, brother. Uh, but brother, you're not hearing me. He's negating like their understanding. My brother, you're not hearing me. I'm going to have to hang up on you because you just attacked straw man. Fulfilling is not negating, but fulfilling is not following. I have like a bad internet okay. connection right now, so it's making out. Okay. Like you're like cutting out on my end, so I can't hear everything you're saying. Okay, then you got to get a better connection because we can't have this conversation. Well, go ahead, go ahead. I can't if you can't hear me and you're cutting off. Fulfilling is not negating, nor is it simply following the law of Moses. I'm going to have to block this guy. Sorry about that. Let me try one more time. Brother, you there? Hello. Yeah, what's wrong with your connection? Is it okay now? Yeah, it's good. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Fulfilling, you're attacking straw man. Don't do that. It didn't say negating. Fulfilling is not neg negating, nor is it simply following the law of Moses as is. You understand what the word fulfill means? Yeah. What does it mean? Uh, in in the Greek, it means to fully preach. What else does it mean? Don't don't give me one definition of the lexicon meaning of uh, <clears throat> plerao. What does also mm -hmm. mean? And don't try and impress me with your knowledge of Greek. It's not going to get far. I'm looking at it right now. Just give me one second. Go it to says, Matthew 1, 22. Um, literally oh. to level up uh, or to furnish, okay. satisfy, execute. Okay, listen, you're not listening. Show me the word fulfill in Matthew 1, 22, 23. See, this is what happens when people go to lexical sources and think they understand the Greek. Don't pull that on me, brother. Okay. Don't do that to me because I want to take it as you trying to Pervert scriptures to try to prove your position. Go to Matthew 1, 22 to 23. All right, I'm there. Read it for me. Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Now all this was done, and it might be fulfilled. Which was Do you see that word Lord, fulfilled? Do you see the word yeah. fulfilled? That comes from the same Greek word, fulfilled. How did he fulfill Isaiah 7, 14? 
by simply following it or completing the prophecy, bringing it into fruition and completion. Yeah, that's what he's doing, but okay. it's not. Are you telling me what he's not doing? Are you asking? You want to debate because now you're being arrogant and you're trying to prove your position. I'm going to end up embarrassing you. I told you that. Are you trying to prove your position? Tell me so I can now decimate your argument because you pretended feigning that you want an answer. I mean, yeah, I do want an answer, but I want to just know if my understanding is incorrect or not. No, you're, you're not looking to find it's incorrect. You're telling me it's not and what it is and debating me. Explain to me how Jesus ends that particular sermon. Because he didn't simply say, fulfill the law. He says the law and the prophets. Yet the Mosaic law was the foundation of the prophets, meaning that all the laws that follow after are simply reiteration of the commands of Moses. So why then say law and prophets if he didn't mean something more than what you think? But let's go now to Matthew 7. Let's read now 24 to 27. And if you don't get it, I'm going to send you on your merry way, brother. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Uh, you want me to read it? Mm -hmm. All right, Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things, say, say these things of mine. Of who? Of I whose? will liken him unto a wise of who? man. These things of who? These things of who? These things of who? These things of who? Of his. Okay. Of so he just finished that sermon by concluding saying, the things I told you, you have to do and put into practice. Yeah. And so I you can... agree that he goes on to give injunctions, commandments, do's and don'ts that are not word for word in the law. Right? Uh, or do you just yeah, decide your Bible ends in Matthew 5, I... doesn't go to 6 and 7? Say last part again. Do you, so you decide that your Bible ends in Matthew 5. It doesn't go to 6 and 7. No, no, not saying that at all. But I can show you. Where no, you're not going to show Jesus me anything. Also. You're not going to show me anything. You're going to answer how you're perverting Matthew 5 to your shame. Read Matthew 7, 23 and tell me what that word is, you worker of iniquity. So you're not here to learn. You're here to try to prove your position. I'm going to decimate your arguments and send you back to your merry way. Read Matthew 7, 23. Matthew 7, 23, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Since you like to pretend you know the Greek, what's the word iniquity there? Violation of law. What law? Mosaic law. See, now you're a liar and a son of the devil. Because in 24, he told Why? you, my commands, my sayings. That's the law. G and in Jesus Matthew 28, says, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. When Jesus says, teach them to obey, whose commandments, his or Moses? Mm -hmm. You said Matthew 28, 19. Bye, bye. Ooh. All right. Now they're fake pretending he wants answers. Now for the rest of you, are you ready for me to answer the question for the rest of you? Right. For the rest of you, he's another fake, arrogant twit who thought, He's, uh, he's going to trick me because he's got answer, uh, questions. He didn't. He wanted to debate. Matthew 5, 17, 18, if you read it carefully, what Jesus is saying, he comes to fulfill the law and the prophets. Fulfill means not simply <clears throat> binding you to <clears throat> obedience to the law and the prophets. Fulfill means the law and the prophets point to him. The law and the prophets were designed to be fulfilled in him. Completed in him, perfected in him, subsumed in him. <clears throat> right? You understand? Because I'm going to prove that to you. In the context, fulfill means that the law and the prophets were designed to be subsumed in him, completed in him, perfected in him, realized by him, interpreted, explained by him. Now, how do I know that? Continue reading chapter 5, 6, and 7. He says, you have heard it was said, but I say to you. That's number one. That's number one. Number two, in Matthew 7, 23 to 27, Jesus says that those who come to him on that day saying, Lord, Lord, did, not, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do miracles in your name? I will tell them who thought they were Christians, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. 
The word iniquity is anomian, meaning without law. That's Matthew 7, 23, without law. What law? My law, because in 24 to 27, I don't know where first and last went, 24 to 27, Jesus says, I will tell you what the man is like who hears these sayings of mine and does them. These sayings of mine and does them. Not the sayings of Moses, not the sayings of the prophets, my sayings and does them. He's like a rock, a house built on a rock. And I'm going to tell you what the man is like who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. So whose sayings, whose commands, whose law? Moses or Jesus's? And then in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, how does Jesus end or how does Matthew end his gospel? Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Whose sayings, whose laws? Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Did he say, teaching them to a, everything that Moses and the prophets have commanded you? Is that what he said? Did you catch it? Whose law do we follow? 1 Corinthians 9, 21. 1 Corinthians 9, 21. Watch here. This guy thought he's slick. Don't come here in China debate me and prove your point get out of here man you don't you want to believe what you believe god deal with you first Corinthians 9 21 to them that are without law as without law being not without law to god but under the law of christ so notice what paul says those who didn't have the law i didn't bind them to the law i didn't preach law to them even though i'm under the law of christ did he say the law of moses or the law of christ galatians 6 verse 2 Galatians 6, verse 2. So let me answer this question thoroughly and be done with this objection. Galatians 6, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Moses or the law of Christ? Okay, you see it? Now, let's go to Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. Yep, Maximilian, you're sadder still because you just got muzzled like a dog. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. Pay attention here. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. I got more, and we'll finish this. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Now notice four. My servant, whom I love and adore, my spirit will be on him. I will send him to do what? Notice verse four. Isaiah 42, verse four. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. Whose law? And the Hebrew word, guys, is Torah. Go look at the Hebrew. It's Torah. The isles, the nations will be looking for his law, his Torah, the Torah of my servant, whom I love, my spirit is upon him. Whose law? Moses' law or the law of the servant? One more time, Isaiah 42, verse 4. Let's see. Watch here. I'm going to wrap it up in one more minute with this. He shall not fail to, nor be discouraged till he have said judgment in the earth and the isle shall wait for his law now according to new testament who fulfilled this matthew 12 17 to 21 matthew 12 17 to 21 who fulfilled isaiah 42 verses 1 to 4 matthew 12 17 to 21 guys pay attention please don't be distracted because this is important we're gonna have to wrap it up after this that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by esaias the prophet saying did you catch it there's that word fulfill. I came to fulfill the law and prophets. So Jesus fulfilled Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. He fulfilled the prophets. How? 
by doing what Isaiah said he would do. And what would he do? Here you go. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. We just read that. I will put my, my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Did you catch it? Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4, fulfilled in Jesus. I came to fulfill the law and the prophets, not destroy them. And here's I fulfill them. I do everything they said I would do. And one of the things they said I'd do, I would complete the law and the prophets, bring out their true meaning, subsumed in me, consummated in me. And they even told the people, when I come, it's my law they'll follow. Does everyone understand what it means now? Everyone got what it means? Uh, Carolina, shut up, you man wannabe. You wicked man wannabe. That's why you can't stay married, because you think you're a man and you, you lord it over men. And you wear the suit in the house and your husband wears the, the dress. Stupid. Andy, another one wants to be a man. Hey, 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 Andy, hey, hey. Oh, I'm sorry, you're Timmy. My 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 refrigerator's on the Andy, hey, hey, hey. a girl named Carolina is coming and shouting in caps, trying to bully men, trying to emasculate men because she thinks she's a man. Hey, 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 hey. Andy, hey, hey. funny, huh? Hey, hey. Shh. Timmy, you're off the wall. All right. Now, part of Jesus fulfilling the law. Can I now finish the next point? Part of Jesus fulfilling the law included sending the apostles in the power of the Holy Spirit to bind Christians to new commandments revealed by Christ through them and free them from old commandments. Can I show you that? He is. He's cold-hearted. He's a cold-hearted snake, Emmanuel. You got it. <laughs> Can I show you that? Part of Jesus fulfilling the law and prophets include sending the apostles in the power of the Holy Spirit to bind Christians to new commands, new instructions, new revelation given from Jesus by the Spirit through them and freeing them, freeing them from old commands. Can I show you that? John 14, 26. John 14, 26. Pay attention, guys. We're almost done with this topic. And then we're going to listen to the James White debate. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So what will the Holy Spirit do? Remind you of what I taught you, enable you to recall it and perfectly memorize it and preach it, and he will teach you all things. Now, John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, 12 to 13. Watch here. John 16, 12 to 13. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. See, I want to tell you more things, but you can't handle them now. So I have to wait until the Holy Spirit comes. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not, and we're waiting for the second part, speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Okay. Did Jesus lie? God forbid. That would be blasphemy. Jesus said, my apostles, you're not ready for all the revelation I want to give you. When I leave and I give you the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will enable and empower you to receive things that you can't handle now, and he'll reveal things to come. Now, notice the work of the apostles. They don't simply repeat what Jesus taught them. They then teach new revelations, new instructions, new commandments, that the Holy Spirit gives them, which he receives from Jesus whom he hears. Do you see it? He will not speak on his own initiative. He will reveal to you what he hears. Hears from who? From me and the Father. And let's wrap it up. Matthew 16, 18 to 19. Alexander, because you're a stupid joke. I block idiots and morons who think they know the Bible. You guys are jokes. You're tools of the devil. You're disgusting. May God grant you repentance to the truth in Jesus' name and save you or give you what you deserve. I don't waste time with clowns. You guys are idiots. I'm sorry. 
Matthew 16, 18 to 19. Sorry, guys. This challenge is not going to be for the faint of heart. Matthew 16, 18, 19. Jesus speaking to Peter. Watch here. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I notice that 19. And I will give unto thee the kings of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind, what you bind, bind means what you bind Christians to do, shall have been bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Did you catch it? You, Peter, will be authorized by me to bind Christians to things on earth that have been bound in heaven and free, loosen Christians from things they were bound to because I will give you the authority and reveal it to you by the Spirit. Matthew 18, 17, 18. Matthew 18, 17, 18. Exactly, Rusty. Matthew 18, 17, 18. And if he shall neglect to hear them, let unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. Treat him like an unbeliever. Get him out of your midst. Throw him out. Verily I say to you, whatsoever ye, my apostles, my followers who build the church, bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Now, did you now get the answer? Now, in light of all these passages, so go rewatch this until it becomes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus mean? Fulfill the law and prophets. I came to do everything they said I would do. I came to consummate the law and the prophets because they are fulfilled in me, consummated in me, subsumed in me, and they announced beforehand what I would do when I come, and I'm going to do all they said, thereby completing their prophecies concerning my advent. And it's my explanation, my interpretation, my completing them that you're bound to follow. And part of that means you have to follow the law that I will reveal through the apostles in the power of the Holy Spirit. Get love out of here, please. Please get love out of here. And can I give you an example of the apostles exercising the authority that Jesus gave them by the Holy Spirit to bind Christians to certain commands and loose them from other commands? Mods, come on. What's going on? Love you guys. Can I give you an example? Where they bound Christians to do things and freed them, loose them from doing other things. Can I give you an example, guys? You guys want an example? Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. When the Jews were debating with Paul and Barnabas about Gentiles, saying they must get circumcised to be saved and keep the law of Moses, what did they do? They freed, they loosed the Gentiles from that requirement, but then bound them, bound them to carry certain commands, commands revealed to them by the Holy Spirit, Acts 15, 28 to 29. There you go. And we're done. Lord willing, I'm going to go listen to the James White debate, and I'll give you the link in a minute. Acts 15, 28 to 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. See, the Holy Spirit revealed it to us and through us to lay upon you no greater burden, not to bind you to anything else than these necessary things. So we bind you by the Holy Spirit inspiring us to enjoin you to do these things. So we bind you to the following, that you abstain from things, offer titles, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual morality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. You got it now? Did everyone now understand what Jesus meant by fulfilling the law and the prophets? You don't eat blood and animals that don't have the blood drained from them, Solus. So if an animal's blood has not been drained, you don't eat its meat. And you don't drink blood. Clear, everyone? Everyone understood? Water baptism, the body of Jesus Christ, death, resurrection, our union with him through faith, which is turning to Christ, confessing him as Yahweh, our Lord, calling on his name, being baptized for his sake, 
and how that, all that is true faith that saves, and how Noah's flood, right, and Moses in the ark prefigure water baptism, Jesus' physical death and resurrection, which saves us like it saved them, right, and what it means for Jesus to fulfill the law and the prophets. Did all of that make sense? So now let me give you the link to those debates. See if you want to watch, because I want to watch it. Let's see. Let me get find the link. Hold on. See, we can find the link. Here it goes. All right. It's it's coming on in 15 minutes. Here you go, folks. Dr. Jeff Riddle, Dr. James White is Mark 16 verses 9 to 20, not original or inspired. Now, Dr. Jeff Riddle is not the best debater. So I want you to be careful of rhetoric, right? Rhetoric, emotional manipulation, right? Appealing to emotion, because James White is a master of that. I got to be honest. Master of rhetoric and emotional manipulation. Don't fall for it. And Lord willing, in the next session, I'll give you links to James E. Snap that has pretty much decimated the pathetic arguments of scholars like James White, denying the authenticity of Mark 16, verses 9 and 20. He did a session for me on my channel he did a session for Al Fadi on his channel and William Albrecht. And he has an open challenge to James White. Debate me on Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and John 7, 53, 8, 11. And James White, in his cowardice, doesn't debate him. Yes, in his cowardice, he told someone else not to debate him either. So that tells me he's not interested in truth. Because if you're interested in truth and you're confident of your position, why don't you debate James Snap, who is more than able to, to put you in your place because he's more of a scholar than you in this issue. Why are you avoiding him? He told Steve Boyce, Stephen Boyce, Stephen Boyce, don't debate James Snap. And if you listen to the last session he did on that same YouTube channel, he was asked, will you debate James Snap? He goes, oh, I want to de debate James Snap on John 6, not on textual issues. He avoided accepting the challenge like the plague. And I cannot respect someone who in his cowardice would tell people don't debate him and won't debate him on such a vitally important issue, even though he passes himself off as a scholar of the New Testament textual transmission. Pathetic. So he chooses to debate people whom he knows are not good debaters and as knowledgeable as him. There you go. And James Snap is going to be in the comment section. There you go. There's a the link. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, the eternal Son of the Father eternal companion of the Holy Spirit. May he wash us in his blood, seal us by his spirit to be in love with him, to live for him more passionately and even die for him if necessary, to remain faithful till he calls us home or he returns and may he bless my daughters and bring them to me. Please, almighty son of God, bring them to me and we love you, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Christ bless you. I'll see you maybe tonight. I may surprise you. I may do a lightning session or tomorrow. Take care.